Good afternoon and welcome back to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History for today's fifth session of the Symbiosis Conference. My name is Jack Matthews and I'll be providing technical support today. Just a reminder of how our system works. We're using the Webinar Jam system. If you have any connection issues at any point, please do click the reconnect button at the top of the page and that should solve most of your connection issues. And if you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. Do ask your questions in the chat. And if you can click the little circle button to the right hand side of your questions, that will then go red with a little cue in it. And John, today's chat will pick those up and we'll put as many of those to the speakers as possible. Just a reminder that you will be able to watch the talks again on the Symbiosis website, those talks for which we have permission from the speakers are being recorded and will be put on the website. So we'll be watching them again and share them with anyone else you think might be interested. And finally, just to say, after the end of today's session, you will all get an email in your inbox requesting some feedback. This will help shape future symbiosis events and we really appreciate any of your thoughts. So that will be going straight to your inboxes at five o'clock. GMT. Yeah. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to John Holmes, who's going to be chairing today's session. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is John Holmes. I'm Professor of Victorian Literature and Culture at the University of Birmingham and uh, the co-organiser of today's event um, and, and well, part of the Symbiosis Committee. Uh, Symbiosis is a, a fairly new network which has been establishing itself over the last couple of years. We, we, we launched it officially at a conference in Berlin last year, and we're hoping to have a follow-up this year uh, here in Oxford in person, uh, but obviously circumstances prevented that, so we've managed to uh, run the conference online instead, and we hope that you've been enjoying it over the last few days. We hope if you joined us today for the first time that you enjoy today's session very much. Um, today's session is on the theme of the arts and the Anthropocene. So our concern in symbiosis as a whole is with uh, researching and promoting the role of the arts, all the arts, literature, music, painting, sculpture, and so forth, within natural history museums. And particularly thinking about the ways in which art and science can work together in the public engagement process in natural history museums. Today's focus is on specifically the problems and challenges of the Anthropocene, which I know is a, a, a contentious category, it's a contentious idea. Um, uh, certainly many geologists that I've spoken to are skeptical that we can really claim to be a geological epoch of our own, but at the very least we seem to be a geological event. And of course what I'm talking about here is the, the massive and uh, rapid um, ecological crisis that is happening around us caused by human impact, particularly um, uh, let's say the global north on, on uh, the environment whether that's climate change or biodiversity loss or pollution or um, uh, ice melt or, or so forth. Um, it's appropriate really that I'm sitting here in uh, Paul Smith's office. Paul Smith is my co-organizer. He's the director of the Oxford University Museum of Natural History and he's kindly given me his office for the day because behind me I have a mural that was painted in the 1850s of the Mare de Glace. Uh, glacier in the Alps. And you can see from this mural that it was a very full uh, glacial flow at that time. That uh, glacier has now largely disappeared because of climate change. So this is a, a symbolic emblem to have behind us. Okay, today we have four very distinguished speakers. I'll introduce each of them in turn. We're going to have two talks of around 25 minutes each, then a brief break for people to go and uh, make tea or whatever you want to do. Uh, we'll resume after that for two more talks. There'll be another brief break and then we'll have a panel discussion. And as Jack said, please do put your questions in the chat. And also please feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves to us. Do, do tell us where you are, where you've come in from, uh, where you're viewing us from. Uh, the first speaker today is Jean-Denis Vigne, who is um, Director General of Research at the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris. And I'm delighted that Jean-Denis has been able to join us because the museum has been taking a lead on um, thinking through these issues. And I want to just show you the, the recent um, manifesto they published a few years ago, uh, the Manifesto du Museum 
manifesto, the museum manifesto. And this uh, confronts exactly the question, what future without nature? So I'm delighted that Jean-Denis, that you're able to join us and we're looking forward very much to your talk. I'll hand over to you now, if I may. Okay. Jean-Denis, we can hear you. Wonderful. Do take it away. Okay. Okay. So if everybody is okay, I will start. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting the, the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle uh, to this uh, uh, conference. Uh, I will try to present uh, how our museum makes natural history shine in culture at the service of the planet. Uh, as you told, John, I, I am a, a CNRS scientist and I am now uh, uh, in charge of the general direction of the museum uh, for research, expertise, valorization and teaching. And uh, in the first part of my presentation, I will um, explain who we are and uh, what are our assets for addressing this, this question uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the the big challenges of our societies facing the environmental change. And uh, I will, uh, in the second part, uh, explain our strategy and uh, illustrate uh, the actions that we are um, doing for, for uh, reaching our goals. Uh, and I will make a, a, a special focus on the manifestos. Uh, OK. So, uh, one of the characteristic of our uh, museum in France is uh, that uh, we are doing as uh, usually do uh, all the natural history museums uh, in uh, in terms of uh, collections, valorization also of the collections and presentations to the public. We have a, a very large uh, natural history collection, 70 million specimens. We are one of the three most important collections uh, of natural history in the world. And uh, we have also living animals, and uh, we have a lot of people coming from elsewhere in Europe and in the world for uh, consulting our collections. We have also 2.2 million graphic documents in, uh, in these collections. And um, uh, concerning the, the, the presentation to the public, we have also six galleries three zoos, one marinarium, six botanical gardens, and two paleo sites. That is a total of 15,000 square meters of permanent exhibition. And what is relatively original is that uh, these sites of presentations are disseminated in Paris, within Paris, but also out of Paris. Nine of them are in Northwest France, Southwest France, Southeast France. We have a total of 7 million visitors, including 3 million uh, millions paying. <clears throat> but uh, apart from these two traditional activities, we also develop uh, more or less usual activities for, for, for the museums. First, uh, a lot of teaching in a postgraduate school or the, equivalent, uh, the French equivalent of a postgraduate school with a master degree and PhD, that is, to, that is 350 cents. We also play the role of an environmental agency for the French government. 300 scientists in the museum uh, are uh, making uh, these uh, uh, biodiversity assessments and, uh, and write a report, uh, expertise report, um, for uh, su supporting the public policies and uh, uh, answering the, the targets of the European directives. And also, uh, we have uh, uh, research, natural history research, like in, in many big uh, natural, natural history museums, but this research is much more developed than in any other natural history museums in the world, with 700 scientists researchers uh, disseminated in 16 laboratories and uh, uh, making a very important uh, volume of activity of research based on 19 and, and, uh, cutting edge analytical platforms. We produce 1,500 1, uh, articles per year, which is 
of course, the, the, the first production for a museum in the world because we have a lot of scientists in the museum. Uh, not only in the in 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 terms of um, of activities, but also in terms of uh, um, uh, knowledge uh, domains, we we are we have a very large activity. Of course, we develop researches and teaching uh, and expertise on the traditional uh, domains of the natural history, microorganism, systematics and evolution. Uh, environmental chemistry, uh, also in the domain of ecology, functional ecology, biomechanics, oceanography, uh, and in the domain of uh, earth sciences, paleontology, uh, uh, geology, and planetology. This is relatively classical for natural history museums, but in addition, which is less usual, uh, especially in Europe, we also develop a lot of, of activities in the domain of uh, human and social sciences, in the within the department uh, called entitled humans and environment uh, this is 250 scientists including 100 archaeologists and we have labs of primatology human ecology paleogenetics we have also several labs working on the social behaviors facing biodiversity and environmental change and of course we have also uh, a, a long duration historical with historical and prehistorical approaches of uh, interactions between humans and their environment. We have also a, a very important activity of uh, uh, citizen science, which allow us to increase our impact on the society in terms of uh, of um, uh, embed of, of the populations. So, if I summarize, uh, so wh why is it uh, why the, the Paris Museum is, is uh, a little bit different from the others in Europe? It's because we have a long history, including human sciences. Um, right at the beginning, when uh, the museum was uh, uh, only the, the King Garden, and, and then uh, at, in the second half of the 18th century, uh, the natural history of humans were in to totally included in the natural history. And when the museum had been created in, in 1793, uh, within what, uh, humanities and human, uh, human anatomy was one of the 12 laboratories. During all the second half of the 19th century and during the 20th century, these activities in anthropology uh, developed in a lot of different directions until the, the, the creation of the Musée de l'Homme, which is part of the Natural History Museum, and which is developing especially researches on humans and, and, and societies. Uh, we develop new laboratories of prehistory, ethnobiology, biochemistry. And this is important because we can make the synthesis, synthesis between cultural approaches and natural approaches. I will come back to that in, in a short time. Um, this is this is a, a, a very important asset for addressing the present challenges of the Anthropocene, because as you all know, it's not possible to address these challenges without taking uh, into consideration both together social systems and environments and their interrelationships, of course, in the framework of the what we call sometimes anthropos systems. And the second aspect is that we are doing that at different time scales, uh, interlocked time scales from the origin of life to the origin of humans and origin of societies. So, if I summarize what I just described briefly, uh, three points are emerging. First, we we are tackling a diversity of complementary tasks collection dissemination, yes, of course, but also research, teaching, and expertise. Second, we are able to integrate natural and cultural approaches into the same reflection, which is rather rare in Europe, but more common in North or South America, natural history museums. And third, we are tackling the diverse and interlocked time scales. This is a, 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 a large a fan of uh, assets, and this gives us the possibility to play a key role in addressing the environmental crisis of climate change, habitat loss, and mass, mass extinction 
brought about by the impact of modern human societies on the natural world, we are able to do that more than any other natural history museums. And the consequence of that is that it's difficult, of course, but that the, the main consequence is that we are facing the tremendous responsibility to achieve these goals. And this is for that reason that our museum um, uh, underwent a, a, a very deep and rapid transition between the end of the 20th century and, and, and now, during the last 20 years, we, we, we shifted from a, a, a kind of century of knowledge, uh, as all the natural history museums, all the museums, to a social actor, and a social actor which should be uh, fitted in the, in, in the societies, which, which should answer uh, the, the questions of the societies, and which finally uh, sh uh, have to, to, to commit um, uh, with the with the society on these big questions. Um, the strategy that we developed uh, for uh, addressing this uh, this challenge uh, are of different kinds. First, we are trying to strengthen the interactions between the different activities and domain which are within the museum. It's not it's not only to say that. We have uh, human sciences and we have uh, uh, natural sciences, we have uh, research and we have collections. What's important is to really uh, 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 stimulate the connections and the synergies between these activities. For example, we are nourishing the continuity between fundamental and finalized researches in order to create a, a continuity between research, fundamental research and expertise and to be more uh, more uh, ready to, to answer the questions of the societies in, in, the, in this situation. We also try to develop new research on the collections in order to evaluate the, this information, the molecular information, the, the isotopic information which is hidden in these collections, not only the, the objects themselves, uh, and so on. Uh, the second line of strategic orientation is uh, aiming to, to, to fight the obscurantism and to promote an universalist vision of humanity by promoting science as the only way for developing the universal knowledge, contrary to the personal or the category-specific opinions, which are respectable, of course, but which are uh, of different nature from, uh, from science. And by this way, we try to fight the distrust, the distrust, the distrust of our societies toward the scientific culture. Third line, it consists in approaching the question of the evolution of the planet from a perspective that is both scientific and educational in order to promote an universal ethic of the planet. And then in the framework of the dissemination, ex exhibitions and relationship to, to the public, we are developing a voluntary strategy of instructing the public by provoking marveling facing the beauties of biodiversity. This is the, the artistic part of our activity because we consider the collections and the biodiversity in itself as a, 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 a art object. And we found our, our uh, action on uh, the, the idea that tangible reality of the material object that we presented our exhibitions is uh, moving people and it's and create um, uh, fun, uh, interesting uh, e efficient conditions for instructing the public last but not least we also develop in parallel images for an immersion pedagogy where the visitor becomes an actor like in a lot of different museums of course the actions that we developed for uh, reaching this this uh, this goal and for nourishing this strategy uh, are four, uh, four main lines. Uh, Butchings for the re reliability of the knowledge which are delivered by the museum. Of course, this is the basic of, of research, of science, uh, delivering good results and, uh, and, uh, and promoting um, the, the good science uh, in terms of uh, rigor and quality. 
Second point is uh, playing a, a driving role of uh, a driving natural heritage by developing the collections and their digitalization and the opening to all the uh, scientists and citizens. Fourth line uh, consists in uh, affir affirming the educational and cultural role of the museum and more generally speaking of natural history through teaching and training, but also through the development of citizen research and biodiversity inventories and monitoring. Uh, for uh, developing these uh, this, uh, activities, we uh, try to increase the public utility of the museum for better defending the values on, of universalism by getting involved uh, uh, in social debates. This is what I already emphasized. And we develop a, a series of actions for, for that. And I selected here four of them, uh, which are really um, the, the, the mark uh, the, of, the, of the museum. First, we developed a series of temporary exhibitions, especially in the Musée de l'Homme, about uh, uh, societal questions. The first one was human races and racism. The second one was about uh, alimentation and uh, the personalization of alimentation, which is increasing in our societies, and the question about alimentation. Another one was immigration. And we also plan to, to, to do some exhibitions uh, in the next uh, future uh, about piercing, about uh, body beauty and its uh, anthropological and cultural significance, about transhumanism. We also develop a lot of uh, podcasts uh, in the, the, the French radios and, and TVs. Uh, and the two last actions are more specific. One is the organization of uh, uh, free hours debates with scientists and the public about the societal questions. The first one was about what is a risk and how to live with risk. The second one was acting for oceans with the, 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 the tremendous uh, uh, question of uh, ocean uh, biodiversity uh, erosions. The, fir the third one was nature in the city. And uh, last month we had a, a fourth uh, uh, meeting, fourth trip about one planet, one elf, which was really uh, up to date in the, in the uh, sanitary uh, crisis situation that we know. The, the last action that I wanted to, to, to point was this uh, manifestos that John uh, emphasized also at the beginning. Uh, and I will give a few words about these manifestos in order to explain uh, what they are and what we are trying to, to, to say to the society. Uh, through uh, this uh, this action. First, the, the aims is to raise awareness of and disseminate knowledge on the future of our planet. First, knowledge. But also, we want to make one here strong scientific voice based on the contribution of natural history to the way of understanding the major issues facing contemporary societies. The idea is really to uh, reorientate the, the controversies uh, on the center of, uh, of the knowledge which are coming from science. The contents of these booklets uh, are presentations of recent analyses supported by figures from scientific research to allow reader to be informed, to take a step back, or even to deconstruct, receive ideas. These manifestos are, are however, by no means prescriptions of opinion. Their objective is to allow everyone to be able to develop a critical and autonomous spirit. The promotion of this uh, of this booklet is uh, is under the responsibility of the, the direction board of the museum. Uh, for each of them, we we gather twelve to fifteen specialists of. Uh, very diverse disciplines and origins, the majority of whom comes from outside the museum. It's not only the knowledge of the museum. We try to, to draw a very large knowledge. Uh, this uh, this um, specialist write a common text under the coordination of a leader specialist. And the final text is uh, reviewed by the president of the museum for uh, 
uh, checking if all is uh, okay from uh, an institutional, institutional point of view and, and scientific point of view. Of course, uh, the format uh, they are uh, small books. Uh, they should be readable by anybody uh, in less than one hour, and uh, therefore they are containing uh, only. They are composed of uh, fifty pages in French and their translation in English, that is to say the total is less than 100 pages. There are very little illustrations, uh, five to six in, on double page in the central pages, mostly coming from the documentary of natural history collections in order to promote the beauty of uh, biodiversity, of environment, as a way to, to convince that this is moving, so this is interesting, so this is important. Uh, we are um, we we make one manifesto per year. So we began in uh, in 2017, and now we have four manifestos, and it's the very cheap booklet, uh, 7.5 uh, euro each. Um, if I have still time, I will just uh, get through the the four uh, manifestos that we already published. The, the first one was a, a foundator. Uh, Manifesto, What Future Without Nature, uh, in which we develop the idea that we cannot, uh, we, we, we cannot live without nature, we, can, we cannot be without nature. Uh, and this uh, booklet has been written by scientists, sociologists, and philosophers, uh, which, who, who send a strong signal aiming to alert public opinion and provide the key to understanding our environmental position, uh, uh, positioning in natural history at the earth of environmental and societal uh, issues of the 20th century. The second one was in connection with the exhibition that I already mentioned about uh, migration, migrations, and it explores the migratory phenomenon in the living world, drawing on the, pre the, the precious analytical tool provided by natural history to make clear that migrations are not only uh, a topic of, of controversy in our societies, but that they are uh, written in our essential, uh, in, our, in our nature of, of uh, animals and of humans. The, fourth, the third book was in, entitled Humans and Other Animals. Uh, for this book, uh, psychologists, veterinarians, law, lawyers, lawyers uh, ethologists and archaeologists or those neuroscientists argue for a total integration of the human species. You see that it's also the same idea, finally. Regardless to the technological evolution we have undergone uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, the idea is uh, that to think we could do without this integration is not in keeping with the notion of life and would prevent us from taking measure of the real risk represented by the current collapse of biodiversity. And the last uh, manifesto, uh, which uh, was issued last month, uh, is entitled Facing the Limits uh, in connection with the, with the exhibition Transhumanism that we will open next year, hopefully. Uh, and uh, in this booklet, uh, we, we, we developed the idea that between decline and enchantment, uh, uh, that, we are, that, that this, this perspective are, uh, have, have to be situated between decline and enchantment and where, uh, where we are going uh, in the future. Neither a promoter of transhumanism nor hero of uh, ecological apocalypse, natural history invites us to consider the future by putting into perspective the notion of limits, scales, times, and space. So um, it, it was very fast, I'm sorry, and my English is not so good, so I hope that everybody was able to understand. But what I want to, to emphasize in this presentation is that really we take the, the natural history and the environments are beauties of the world, we try to to uh, to, to evaluate uh, this uh, the, the emotion that is provoked by this beauty to uh, to educate people. We try to promote science, and uh, this is a kind of connection between art, 
the natural art and the uh, uh, science and education. And this is the, 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 the point of the, the project that we are developing under the direction of uh, Bruno David uh, since uh, now four years in the museum. And I will finish on, the, on this last uh, slide uh, for uh, emphasizing that uh, most of the ideas that I developed in this presentation are coming from the personal project and from the uh, museum project under the presidence of uh, Bruno David. And I thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you will have some questions and I would be really happy to uh, discuss with the other uh, uh, the other presenters and also with all of us, all of you, uh, in the next uh, minutes. I hope I will not have been too late, too, too long. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jean-Denis. You, you kept perfectly to time, so don't worry at all about being being too long. Uh, and I'm delighted to see that the, the, the booklet that I picked up at the museum is the first of a series and, and not merely a one-off. That's excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, now I'm going to introduce our second speaker, who's Nicole Heller, who's at um, the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, and who is, uh, in particular, ha has the, the, the extremely apposite title of curator for the Anthropocene, uh, so entirely um, focused on the, on the concerns that we're raising and discussing today. Uh, but also it's worth saying that the Carnegie has, again, like the, the Musée National d'Histoire Naturelle, the Carnegie is another museum that's very much taken a lead on thinking about um, the ways in which natural history museums can can address the crisis of the Anthropocene and also actually on thinking about the role of, of the arts in that. So I'm delighted to be able to welcome Nicole to speak to us today. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you. All right. Hi. Um, it's nice to be here. Uh, thank you to the organizers and to have a chance to talk with you about the way that um, how important the arts is, I think, for um, interpreting the Anthropocene and for uh, really understanding it and developing the science. So I'm going to talk to you today mostly about kind of different art projects that I've been involved in. And I'm mostly focusing on um, art in in terms of um, visual art, uh, social practice art, different kinds of art practices and the way that that's been a really critical part of um, developing an approach to global change ecology and particularly to uh, interpreting it with publics. So, you know, it's I don't think a surprise to anyone. I mean, art is so um, is such a natural partner for natural history in the sense that it's both our natural history is deeply focused on um, kind of close noticing um, observations, detailed accounts. And I think art shares that, that kind of practice and point of view. Um, natural history itself, oh, let me find, okay, there we go. Um, you know, is art is such a deep part of natural history. I mean, we take dioramas and they really are, um, perhaps more art than they are science in, in how much kind of subjective interpretation they are. They're really created canvases that incorporate the bodies of, um, of real animals. And um, so in this sense, there's a deep tradition of art in the interpretive practices of natural history. But as I think, as we face the Anthropocene, we really need to kind of expand our way that we think of using art, working with art, um, working with artists in, in the practice. So if you think about the Anthropocene as a phenomena, um, a concept that we're engaging with in, in natural history, it's, it has all of these dimensions that make it incredibly complex and novel in many ways. So it's speculative. It is multi-scaled in space and time. It's deeply social ecological. So it kind of immediately, it's about that intersection of nature and culture and kind of challenges many of the um, fundamental ways that we've organized um, natural history stories. Um, 
it is uses in based in earth system science. And so kind of new data that has not really been traditionally the domain of natural history, but bringing in satellite data, big data sets is kind of very um, genomics, you know, big, uh, big data sets that really challenge our ways of um, in doing exhibition and interpretation to bring those data sets in. Um, it's political. Uh, the notion of the Anthropocene is is contested and political. Um, and, you know, when does it start? Um, who decides that? All of these ideas are deeply, um, they're meaningful. And, and as much as the Anthropocene is a scientific concept, it's also a social, cultural, and political concept. And I think that's incredibly important for us to understand. Um, as, as science institutions, as we engage with this, this concept. Um, it's also emotionally difficult and cognitively difficult to understand. You know, we're talking about planetary collapse and that's just not, uh, a fun or easy topic for people to engage with. And then kind of really challenging people to think across time scales and, um, spatial scales that are not, um, easy cognitively. So, you know, to sum it up, it's a super complex concept, but that's what makes it so exciting. And when I first started my work at the Carnegie Museum, um, uh, as a curator of the Anthropocene, um, or curator of Anthropocene studies, you know, a lot of people said to me, Oh, is this just a rebranding of kind of same old environmentalism? And so I've been working really hard to kind of really study the literature that is emerging and, and the different uh, practices that are emerging in the context of the Anthropocene. And, and what it is, it's not just a rebranding of the 20th century kind of environmentalism. It really is an emerging transdisciplinary field that requires new practices to tell kind of nature culture stories, to really challenge ourselves to think tell stories differently and build those stories with publics in new ways and bring um, scientific information together with information from the humanities and the arts or practices and knowledges to construct kind of um, new, I, I would say a new transdisciplinary um, knowledge and understandings. So in kind of to demonstrate, you know, in my, um, lab or in our sec, in the section of Anthropocene studies at the Carnegie Museum. Um, I'm so far working with, um, uh, two people are kind of officially in the lab and, um, or in the section. And one is Asia Ward and she is an artist. Um, she's a social practice artist and a museum educator, um, an interdisciplinary artist. And, and so I wanted to work as a scientist, I wanted to work directly with an artist in doing this kind of science communication work. Um, the other um, person that I'm lucky to have working in um, with me is Bonnie McGill, and she is an ecosystem ecologist um, and social ecological um, kind of resilience ecology, as well as um, a practicing artist. And so she's bringing those skills together to kind of um, really try to find new ways to sort of work with publics in system thinking and communicate data in ways that can be more effective. Um, so what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk is really just kind of different ways that we um, in natural historians or scientists can work with artists, um, work with arts practices and the different ways that that can really help us in interpreting the Anthropocene and galvanizing public interest um, and action. And so um, there are so many ways and really it you know could just generate laundry lists. And so I've just chosen some of the ways that are most exciting to me and some of the kinds of work that I've been involved in or um, projects that I, I find really exciting. Um, so I think one of the first things is recognizing that arts is really vital for mapping and interpreting these complex systems. 
Um, often art, you think about, well, you know, artists are really good at expressing the unexpressible, right? The invisible, those things that emerge at scales that are difficult to see, uh, concepts. And so in that sense, art is really a necessary part of, of expressing the Anthropocene and um, mapping it. Uh, it's very important for raising awareness, um, creating emotional impact. Another way I think is really challenging us to expand our thinking. And this is one of the ways that I've really benefited by working with artists is really challenging me to think differently about um, the way I look at the science, the way I look at the natural world, the way I try to um, describe that or work with publics. Um, art practices are extremely helpful at opening up hard conversations with publics, um, as well as building community. And, um, and finally, kind of through these practices, I think it really can drive institutional change. So kind of what is a natural history museum look like in the 21st century and how is it transformed? I think that that transformation is coming through engagement with um, the arts and the humanities. Um, so I'm just going to now give kind of some examples of different art projects that sort of demonstrate these different ideas. So first sort of thinking about kind of fundamentally this idea of how how can we tell stories about the Anthropocene? You know, the classic way to look at a natural history museum or the classic interpretive strategy was really through this objects, right? Here is an owl, for example, and here's what an owl likes to eat and where it lives. But the Anthropocene stories are so much more complex. And here I think we can really find value in Timothy Morton's notion of a hyper object. So, um, you know, this is a word to describe kind of all kinds of things that you can study and think about and compute, but they're not easy to see or you can't observe them directly. You can't just look at the owl, right? So here is um, an example of Chris Jordan's work, an artist who really tries to demonstrate these global uh, phenomena. And you can see now we see the owl embedded into a whole uh, display of owls, right? Where it depicts, in this case, 183,000 birds equal to the estimated number of birds that die in the United States every day from exposure to agricultural pesticides. So here, it's this way of trying to get us to move beyond just that one owl. And the owl can be like a hyper object to a whole set of interrelations that are human and they're ecological, that are global and local, that that are really where the Anthropocene kind of sensibility, the understandings um, and challenges need to be understood and worked on. Um, you know, other neat ways of kind of trying to demonstrate environmental data, the Center for Genomic um, Gastronomy is this, they do this smog tasting where they basically sample, kind of map air quality in regions through whipping up eggs that incorporate that air. And then you can taste the, um, the heavy metals that are in that or the VOCs. And so it's like, again, making the invisible visible, which is such a key element to um, Anthropocene storytelling and, and understandings. Uh, an artist that I worked with in an exhibition um, at Duke University, I Mark Nystrom does a lot of these beautiful ways of, of basically data visualization. So in this case, this is a, a data visualization of his personal carbon dioxide emissions and average. And so the, the amount of um, air in the balloons is reflective of those personal emissions. So he's he's trying to make it real for people. And this involves children and doing this kind of bringing community together to blow these balloons up is actually really fun in of itself. Uh, another um, example of Chris Jordan, who I think not only helps us map and interpret the Anthropocene or Anthropocene um, challenges, but also brings that emotional impact that is so profound. So, you know, these are pho photography of birds in um, Midway Island and the kind of contents of their, their stomachs of bringing attention to plastic pollution. 
Um, Edward uh, Bertinsky is um, made a lot of attention um, uh, this last year or maybe two years ago with a Anthropocene exhibition that are these giant kind of landscape scale uh, depictions of um, environmental change, terraforming and the impacts of humans. And so these are, I think a lot of people kind of classically think of this this art when they think of the Anthropocene and it's, it's really um, important and pro uh, impactful, but also you really doesn't have a human subject in it. And I, the art that I'm more interested in, and I think natural history has a kind of mm, a special, um, maybe couldn't have a special relationship with is art that really brings it down more to that human level and engages us as, you know, uh, an animal, right? Engaged in a world with other animals and, and kind of thinking about like, I've been in influenced by books like, um, edited by Anna Singh, like the arts of living on a damaged planet that really asks us in confronting the Anthropocene to think about what does this mean for how do we live? How do we relate to each other? How do we relate to non-human beings? And how can we kind of emphasize and find and understand those mutual benefits of interaction? So, so we see many artists kind of working with these kinds of ideas of really rethinking our relationship to non-humans. Um, Marina Zerkow is a, an artist who has really incredible collection of work. And this is one of her projects with, with some other artists called Dear Climate, where they um, make these kind of wonderful, provocative, um, you know, posters sort of examining uh, feelings and different kinds of relationships and different um, ideas about how we can relate in in response to this, these crises like climate change. Um, this artist, I'm showing here the work from an artist, a Pittsburgh artist, Ashley Cecil. And this, I think, is really neat example of one of the ways that um, are what we do at the museum. And as we turn to face natural um, the Anthropocene, it will drive kind of larger um, change. So Ashley uh, was a artist in residence at the museum a couple years ago when the Carnegie put on an exhibit called We Are Nature. And she, um, you can see in her art that she's doing now, these are from a studio visit earlier this year. She's really, um, whereas her earlier art was kind of more focused on the birds or um, beautiful illustrations of a bird. She became very interested in, in this notion of kind of, you know, how integrated we are with ecologies as we, you know, we can think of our own bodies as deeply, um, you know, as ecosystems, right? And so I love the way that her art is kind of, is transforming through this interaction to sort of create this beautiful human, non-human, um, visions of ourself, our own identity. Another recent artist who showed at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, well, I'm sorry, the Carnegie Museum of Art, which um, the natural history, we share the building with art. And so that offers really wonderful opportunities for um, cross-disciplinary work and engagement. And uh, one of the curators, um, Hannah Turpin, at the Art Museum put on an exhibition about uh, called Counter Pressures, um, working with uh, regional artists on environmental issues. And here's one of the artists, Paper Buck. Um, this is his settler scene. And this is a, um, what this is, is a landscape that's really transcending, it's, it's, it's working with this multi-scale notion of time. So this landscape, he, um, basically weaves many layers of time into one piece. And you can see at the top, there are fracking lines that are through there and there's kind of pipeline lines. And this isn't the full composition, but, but it's really questioning sort of, um, you know, when we have landscape paintings, what point of view are they coming from and kind of what histories do they cover up? And, and so this one canvas becomes sort of a, an Anthropocene landscape in that it trans, it includes multiple moments in time in one space. Um, so here's another example of an artist, um, Wendy Redstar. And 
her work kind of challenging the way that uh, Native Americans have been represented in natural history museums and, and, and otherwise. Um, and here, a kind of early work she did, these sort of dioramas where she's playing with ideas of what's real and what's fake and what's real in, um, in these kinds of representations. Um, so those are many different ways of kind of art provoking, art helping to interpret uh, complex system science. Um, artists, and another way that artists bring so much to our practice and are so necessary as partners in, in turning our museums to become better social actors or bigger players in the um, environmental change learning ecosystem is through um, kind of sparking social change through community dialogue, right? So this is another Pittsburgh local group called um, Creatives for Climate. They're a group of artists who are really concerned with environmental issues and they've made themselves just incredible partners um, to multiple projects at the museum, the education department, uh, in particular in kind of helping to galvanize um, really, really exciting uh, discussions and bring that out to to the public sector to make kind of engagement with these issues fun and, and deeply personal. Um, one example, we have a learning network that we've been developing at the museum, um, specifically focused on connecting with rural communities. So Pittsburgh is sort of a, a, a city that, um, an urban area, but surrounded by rural communities where the topic of climate change is quite politicized and difficult to talk about. So our um, this project that we're working on and supported by the National Science Foundation is really to try to open up dialogue and make it easier to talk about climate change and, and make those conversations science based. And early on in this project, uh, because of COVID, we had to meet by Zoom, um, but worked with an artist, um, a, a number of artists from Creatives for Climate, but one artist in particular, Anne Rosenthal, who guided the group through this kind of collage making process where it allowed us to kind of come together and start building relationships and explore ideas, um, you know, scientific ideas, but kind of start with our own personal and emotional responses. And then that kind of opened up the group and immediately built trust that we can then build on longer term. Um, other ways that, you know, I've worked with artists in ways that are uh, really exciting for community change and kind of engagement. Uh, there's a, a grant agency called, um, or a small foundation invoking the pause that will really fund just some of the most um, wacky ideas that you can come up with. And they're really um, focused on art and science engagement. And so I had the privilege of working with um, on a couple different projects supported by Invoking the Pause, uh, one of which was with a collaborator, Libby Modern, an artist out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And this project began <clears throat> with a sort of crazy idea about a, how can we have conversations about energy, but it transformed over time into um, this art project where we would where um, her art studio uh, worked with a local bike shop to repair old bikes, get them functioning, and then kind of really make them um, artistically beautiful or fun and and then get them out on the streets to help raise awareness about making biking more safe uh, in this community and just raising awareness about biking as a great mode of transportation. Um, Asia Ward, who I mentioned earlier, who's uh, working with me at the museum, she's um, uh, shared a project um, where an example of kind of social practice art and raising awareness, um, two big issues like energy challenges. This was a project in Minnesota that she did with a group of artists um, where they worked with the local power plant to use its uh, plume um, to put light displays on and address topics of energy um, with community, allowing people to kind of propose their own ideas of what should be up on the plume and kind of generate a larger community dialogue about energy in the region. So I, I hope, you know, through a lot of these examples, um, I think you can see the way that by working with artists, 
um, and art practices, it can kind of start to drive institutional change and, and, and kind of help us start to make, you know, natural history in a sense kind of div give us platforms and ways to tell these nature culture stories, these new ways of relating to non-humans and, and thinking differently about ourselves and our roles in, uh, in larger ecologies, in, in nature. Um, and so this, so through, um, so one of the things we've done at the Carnegie is kind of, to, as we're starting to try to hold these ideas together is we created a space called the living room um, that was deliberately juxtaposing co collections from different sections with research, art, literature, poetry, um, and with couches to make this a comfortable space and to kind of start to prepare our community and ourselves for like a new way of talking and thinking about these environmental challenges. And hopefully to make it a little bit less scary, kind of this way of saying, well, let's, 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 let's face these issues and create comfortable interdisciplinary spaces to, to think about them and talk together. Uh, the first artist that we featured the work of was a woman named Catherine Chalmers, who had a video um, piece called Antworks, this incredible um, kind of blurring uh, between natural history and art as she worked with ants to create these incredible movie. And um, I hosted her uh, in a program we called The Arts of Living in the Anthropocene, where we then had um, a curator from the art museum and I talked together with this artist about kind of the similarities between art practices and natural history and kind of how that can work together to address these uh, complex global challenges. Uh, final kind of the last example I think I'll talk about is, is um, an art collective called Not an Alternative. They have a pro project called the Natural History Museum. And again, this is on this topic of institutional change, this art collective has been an incredible um, kind of agent of change in natural history and, um, and, and provo provocative, provocateur of, um, through kind of demonstrating new natural history practices, new ways to tell stories, do interpretation, really elevate the voices of, um, of, of groups that have been marginalized. So for example, in this case, they worked with the Lumi Nation um, from the Salish Sea in, um, um, on the Pacific side of North America um, in a project called the Whale People, Protectors of the Sea. Uh, bringing the kind of point of view, uh, totem, um, and, and, and kind of really bringing a different, um, the Lumi based epistemology and on top, a way of seeing the world and understanding the world that, um, so rather than, so really letting their point of view drive this, um, this kind of storytelling and using multimedia, using artistic approaches to create a very uh, communal and deeply impactful way of telling natural history stories with a lot of attention to current land and water struggles. Um, another project, uh, a project we did with them um, was to host a program where we had talked about um, um, labor, we talked about kind of Appalachia history, so the history in our region and about water, air, ecology, but in the context of labor and labor history and including, um, Joe, um, Yolhin, um, who, who sang songs, these kind of old Appalachia songs about labor and ecology and kind of uh, some people in the audience just said, well, whoa, this is a really different topic and a really different way of having, they didn't expect this to happen at a natural history museum. And I think that's exactly the point is to kind of do these unexpected engagements that blur the line or erode the line between human and nature to really think more deeply about um, the these challenges that we're facing and have different conversations. So uh, the last thing I'll uh, just end on here is just some final thoughts and opportunities. I. Uh, for me, I, I uh, trained as an ecologist, but I started to become interested in environmental um, 
public communication about um, 15 or so years ago. And I, ki I turned to arts really early on because it was obvious that that was um, just an incredibly powerful set of questions, tools, and practices to, to engage in. But I, I will say that, you know, there, I think there's a lot more to go. We have a lot of work to do in engaging this area and, um, as, as science institutions engaging arts. And, um, I think that what I'm most excited about is this opportunity to really integrate contemporary multimedia, social practice art, humanities much more deeply into natural history, both in, in, inter both in developing the knowledge um, as well as um, in the interpretation practices. And I really wonder kind of what will the Natural History Museum look like? Again, thinking back to some of the work that like the Natural History Museum is doing, how, you know, how much more, um, how can we kind of retain some of the traditional beautiful aspects of the Natural History Museum in the classical model, but bring in, um, um, multimedia, different kinds of art practices to really transform that and make it much more exciting. You know, I, I remember reading that the diorama was sort of like the virtual reality machine of, of 1860. And so it's kind of begs the question now of, you know, what is, you, given the technologies we have, given the um, engagement we have, what kinds of um, performative and deeply impactful and exciting kinds of exhibition could we do at this intersection? Um, I also want to point out that I think there's this interesting tension between a, a more didactic interpretation approach that is typical of um, natural history, or at least people say that, oh, natural history is so didactic, and they don't like that. But, um, but, um, but there is some benefit to that too, right? If you have a direct learning outcome you want, you want to teach people a certain kind of science, there is a sort of dimension of a didactic approach that's necessary. But how do you incorporate that with a kind of more open-ended and provocative interpretation, more abstract oriented uh, uh, interpretations that are more common in art? And I think there's a really interesting question there about kind of how is that best done that's probably deeply important for um, our museums in in working with artists and bringing that in to kind of ensure that the work is both open-ended, um, dialogical, and, and provocative, but also that we really um, use the art in a pedagogical approach to develop um, understandings about the science. Um, and the, yeah, that's the last point I'll just make is, you know, how do we as an institution or, or natural history kind of keep the art world, um, keep the topic on the art world's agenda? I was talking to an art curator recently and they said, well, the Anthropocene was really hot, you know, in 2015, but, you know, is it still, you know, the art world is finicky. It, it has trends and then, and new topics. And so that made me thinking about, well, this isn't a fad, right? This is, uh, we have to keep these topics front of mind and keep the art community engaged. And, um, and so from that point of view, you know, what role can our institutions play in hiring artists, in, in really supporting art, art, um, artistic practices, community building work, um, really incorporating that in to keep this topic, um, on the agenda of, um, of scholars and artists everywhere. So thank you very much. And um, I look forward to uh, questions and discussion later. Thanks very much indeed, Nicole. Okay, so we'll, we're, in keeping with our plan, we're gonna take a brief break now, then we'll have the next two talks from Birgit Ahrens and uh, from Luis Alberto Oliveira, who's speaking, coming to us from Brazil. And um, uh, then we're going to have another brief break and then the, the, the chat after. So do please put in any questions that occur to you into the chat in the meantime. And uh, we'll, we'll resume at quarter past. So quarter past three UK time, about, about eight minutes time. Take a brief break. Thank you.
Hello again, everybody. I, I hope you're, you're all back with us. Um, uh, uh, it, it's quarter past now, so we're going to resume the session. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, who is Birgit Arends. Birgit is absolutely uh, an ideal expert for us to have with us today. Um, she's worked on curatorial projects both at the Natural History Museum in London and at the Museum in Berlin. Her doctoral project was uh, completed three years ago and was, is, is on precisely contemporary art, uh, the environment in the, in the age of the Anthropocene. And she's currently a postdoctoral researcher at um, Bristol University. Uh, British Academy funded postdoctoral researcher, uh, where she's working on, on roots to the Anthropocene, looking at, at arts in the Anthropocene over the last 50 years, so from the 1970 onwards. So, um, Birgit, we're, we're delighted to have you with us and uh, looking forward very much to your talk. I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much, John, for the uh, introduction. And um, thank you very much for the invitation to take part in today's session on the Anthropocene and the arts in natural history museums. Um, I will just explain briefly uh, the format this presentation uh, will take for the next of 20 or so minutes. Um, so I will I will show you um, slides of projects and objects that I have researched that speak to the Anthropocene. And these include objects from natural history museums, but also from the Science Museum collection, which is an obvious link to make when curating the Anthropocene. So how to follow this presentation, um, and I'm mindful we're all homo sapiens, so we're actually very well equipped to listen and to look at the same time. But if you rather concentrate on the visuals, please turn off my voice, you may do that. Uh, or if you um, rather just listen and close your eyes and just listen to my voice. But I think it is it is possible to, to follow, but you will realize that there's a I'm telling a few stories and the images are just scrolling by. Um, so it is about, what I'm trying to do is about an immersion into a visual culture of the Anthropocene. So images of collection objects, documentation of historic scientific practices and contemporary interdisciplinary and artistic practices to understand museums as viewing machines, their institutional authority and the framing of nature images from public areas as well as those from storage that offer insights into museums and their collections as transitional phenomena. And I would also like to draw out uh, and underscore this here that there are some objects that will produce discomfort and challenge you as a viewer in order to recognize and to acknowledge difficult histories. Further to this, of course, images have multiple interpretations. The proposition of the Anthropocene needs to be understood within the many critiques of the term and what the term denotes, as well as the concepts genealogy and its proponents. We also need to ask how Western is the Anthropocene? So the Anthropocene is a turning point to rethink broad topics which are part of Western thinking, which are culture nature relations, human exceptionality, the foundations, political, economic or aesthetic of what we in the West refer to as nature. The uh, Anthropocene discussions contain strong narratives to think about causalities and consequences of human actions and to refigure the directions and trajectories of human societies. As one of the questions is, when did the Anthropocene begin? So I would just allude to the one starting point, but we can talk about the others uh, later in the discussion. So the human caused radioactive radiation since the mid 20th century, together with the so-called great acceleration in post-war concession might become the period that marks the beginning of the geological Anthropocene epoch as discussed by the Anthropocene Working Group, but also is widely debated in the humanities and the sciences. Now, how, how do artists contribute with regards to forms of representation and the problem of scales? Writer Robert McFarlane reflects in his 2016 article, Generation Anthropocene, how humans have altered the planet forever. If the Anthropocene can be said to take place, it does so across huge scales of space and vast spans of time from nanometers to planets, 
and from picoseconds to eons. It involves millions of different teleconnected agents, from methane molecules to rare earth metals to magnetic fields to smartphones to mosquitoes. Its energies are interactive, its properties emergent, and its structures withdrawn. How then would artists work with museum collections in the Anthropocene? Museum collections need to be understood as life. This liveness inherent in historic collections can be activated and reperformed by artists to explore and to bring out the changeability of objects and the use of information contained within objects, collections and practices. Secondly, working with artists on issues of the Anthropocene should mean the sharing of expertise to work with ecological and environmental issues, with materialities and with practices, all of which are foundations of cultures and societies. Intertwined histories. Indian artist Sunaj D gave me some seed balls when we worked on a project at the Natural History Museum in London. The seeds inside the clay balls were collected by him and contributors to another project in 2013 in the urban environment of Bangalore, India. Whatever plant seeds were found during their botanical excursions in the city, the seed balls may contain tomato, marigold, amaranth, Caribbean trumpetry seeds, the intertwined botanical histories with human histories of urbanization. Such entwined histories are characteristic of the shift in thinking with the Anthropocene. Seed balls are made to be actively thrown into an environment. Objects like seed balls help think through the term feral, partly in the way anthropologist Anna Singh uses the term meaning an environmental change enabled by human infrastructures and activities, but not under human control. What levels of control are exerted here and where does human control cease or indeed intertwine with the agency of plants? Human animal to non human animal relations and multi species ethnographies. Sculptor Clara Hobsa created a performative installation called Animal Oculomat, meaning animal viewing machine. It was commissioned by the Museum für Naturkunde Berlin in 2017 and was first exhibited in the museum's Dinosaur Hall. The work was partly motivated by reversing the human gaze towards non-human species. Within the Natural History Museum, nature is preserved for human consumption and understanding. What if the gaze were reversed? The artist seized upon the network of scientific collaborators and science communicators for the research and production of her sculpture, including a computer coder, experts in scenography and museum colleagues who study visitor behavior. The photo thing tempted the visitor to participate in an artistic playful experiment. The player would sit on a stool in the automated photo booth and permit themselves to be photographed from the point of view of a non-human animal, such as a squid, a horse, a spider. The work was deliberately populist and exploited anthropocentrism and human vanity in a playful way. Activating collections and reperformance. Back at the Natural History Museum in London, photographer Christelle Lebar, together with botanists, was looking at found objects within the museum. Here, a couple of cardboard boxes sitting in the British and Irish herbarium were found. It was a found collection that did not come with any instructions. No name, no records in the archive, no records in the collection. Out of this lucky find, we developed a collaborative archival research project that looked closely at the about 1,400 photographic glass negatives and contact prints contained within the two cardboard boxes. After some research, 
We later found that the collection was put together by Sir Edward James Salisbury and that notes and manuscripts by him were in the archive collection at the Royal Botanic Gardens queue, of which he was a later director. Though these notes never explained the making of this orphan collection, it turned out, however, that the collection was first made in the um, sorry, was made in the first third of the 20th century and provides an example of early ecological plant studies using photography. How could this collection speak to us? What is the activation that could be done of the collection or of single images? How did this collection invite any uses? Here, the activation was enabled through a collaboration combining different areas of expertise and different questions that could work with the collection from the present day perspective. In order to explore the original photographic images, we undertook field work in the landscape depicted. This involves studying the original photographs in the museum setting, in the dark room and printing studio and in the environment in which the original photograph was understood to have been taken. It was important to understand where the photographs were taken, the technological apparatus used, the perspectives afforded onto the environment in the study of ecology, as well as the motivations for the photographs and the creation of a collection. In the course of the project, one goal that evolved was to understand environmental change. Had the landscape and the plant species changed within the time frame of almost 90 years between the original photograph and the contemporary photograph. But the artist's pursuit was also to engage with the mystery of the, at first, anonymous early 20th century photographer who slowly revealed himself to the artist through his photographic work, his notes and his publications, but whose motivations for creating the substantial body of work over a period of about 30 years remained in the not quite knowing. The artist's approach was thus one of revisiting, being within the landscape in a non-intrusive way as an observer and not to intervene in the spirit of do no harm. Decolonizing the Anthropocene. Nowhere else is the conflict between the cultures of Western science and the cultures of non-European people so visible than in the collecting practices of European museums. These are reflected in the acquisition, the ordering systems, the archiving and documenting, the conservation or preservation. And of course, scientific exploration went often hand in hand with economic prospecting and, as a consequence, destruction of cultures and environments. At the invitation of the Natural History Museum London, Australian Indigenous artist Daniel Boyd displayed a series of watercolours entitled Up in Smoke Tour. The images were held within blackened archival boxes, like those used in the museum's anthropology collection now. His images are appropriations of historic images of Sydney Harbour, plants, a human skull from Australia, a portrait of individual of the Eora Nation and sculptures from Vanuatu. The images refer to Boyd's personal history as an indigenous Australian, the colonization of Australia by the British, as well as scientific explorations. With the same intent, he also blackened the inside of the museum's Edwardian display cases in which he grouped the images. The images are part of an assemblage which reconstructs histories of the cultures between the European colonizers, scientific explorers, and how the Aboriginals, particularly the Eora people of Varana in what is now modern day Sydney, were portrayed when the region became a British penal colony at the end of the 18th century. To conclude, um, and I realize that the images are running a little bit slower than I expected. Um, we just let them run in a minute. So conclusion, museums are spaces in which collections can be activated in many different ways. 
The museum should be understood as activist and the current planetary crisis ex expressed through the Anthropocene proposition. Together with artists, museums can address uncertainty, fact and fiction. They can activate and instill liveness into collections and explore the imaginary future and the future conditional. I look forward to exploring these questions further in the discussion. Um, John, I just realized we still have got a few images to go, actually. We could just scroll through them. How long do you reckon the, the video will last for? Oh, I don't know. Um, Why don't we take uh, just a few minutes to, to let the video run, just, just for maybe um, three or four more minutes, and then if need be, at, at uh, 25 2 we'll we'll cut it short but then people people who can people can just kind of absorb the images from Birgit's talk for a bit and also think about whether you have any questions and then we'll pick up with Luis's talk in either when the video finishes or in in three to four minutes time yep let's do that No, not so badly timed. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm going to introduce our, our final speaker uh, now. This is um, Luis Alberto Oliveira, and we're delighted to have Luis with us today. Um, I know that your museum, Luis, has been a particular inspiration to Paul and his team here, and it's particularly appropriate for Luis to be joining us because he is um, director of the... the Museum of Tomorrow in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and is, uh, in a sense, to, to follow on a point that Nicole made, the Anthropocene is, is not a fad. It's here in some form or another to stay and we need to think about living with these changes as well as orchestrating some of these changes. So uh, I'm delighted to hand over to Luis, who's going to tell us a little bit about his project and about the, about the museum uh, where he's based. Thank you very much indeed, Luis. Thank you, John. Uh, hi guys, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and talk with you. And I'm particularly glad that many of the ideas and concepts that uh, Jean David, uh, Nicole, and Birgit presented are also resonate with the ideas uh, that we are discussing in the Museum of Tomorrow that I intend to share with you. Well, what is the Museum of Tomorrow? Uh, uh, we are a science museum. Uh, in fact, we are an applied science museum. The purpose of the Museum of Tomorrow is to present to our visitors a journey of exploration of possible future scenarios. In that sense, the collection of the Museum of Tomorrow are possibilities, possible futures. Uh, since we are a science-based museum, this presentation of possibilities are science-based, then science is always changing, is always evolving, is always uh, redirecting itself, new ideas, new discoveries, then we have to update our contents, our collection constantly, otherwise you become a museum of yesterday very quickly. So other museums are conceived to preserve their collection, we have to change and update our collection constantly. So we, uh, because of that, we have to be a digital museum. Our, our infrastructure, our presentations are all digital. We have uh, practically no object, and we are located in uh, a very astounding building. I'm going to show you some some some, some pictures uh, in a very important in place in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil history, a place where between one million and one million and a half Africans were brought to the slave trade to populate Brazil. That's why we are now we are an African country, and. Uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, challenge of, of dealing with people with such uh, an, an original museum, we came to understand that it's, it was absolutely necessary for us to become acquainted with our neighbors. There are four poor communities around uh, where the museum is, uh, the, the very uh, historical downtown center of Rio, and uh, about 30,000 uh, 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 inhabitants. 
And we, we invited them to become acquainted with the museum during the construction of the building. What is this strange spaceship that is landing on the, on, on the harbor? And today I'm very proud to say that we have from these 30,000 neighbors, 4,000 and a half that have become museum friends. And the most uh, satisfying accomplishment of the museum so far, at least to me, was when I saw one kid of the neighbor school uh, uh, taking another kid by his hand and saying, I will show you my museum. Uh, th this is a prize, you see. And so I want to, to give you just a glimpse of what is the museum, what it is working, and, and, and how do we, uh, we perform this integration with our neighbors. So first I'll show you the opening of the museum. Oh, no, there's a, there's a, a, a small video, I think, Jack. So this is the 36 hours of continuous opening of the museum in 2015. So I wish, I wish you to take uh, it's a time-lapse video uh, uh, so you can see what, what is the, 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 the museum in its location. Sorry about that, everyone. I think we're just getting reconnected to Louise. One moment. Louise, you're back with us. Good. Sorry, we had a connection problem there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I will skip the videos, okay? And I will, will try to address you, to, sh to share with you some ideas that we have been discussing and with, with the, within the museum team about this particular moment which we are living in. So, uh, um, the pandemic. What sense can we make of the pandemic? We think that two facts are uh, indisputable. The first one, it was the arrival of the pandemic of the COVID-19 was a disruption. In a very short time, a biophysical agent something of the size of a string of hair is split in 20,000 parts, become a civilization stopper. That is, in a very short time, it spread out from one place of emergency and became global. And it made 4 billion people go into quarantine. So it disrupted the functioning of the very complex, very sophisticated capitalist contemporary civilization. So the emergence of this biophysical agent was disruptive, was in a certain sense a discontinuity, but now we are living with it. That is, the post-pandemic is living with the COVID, addressing its, its issues, and not just overcoming it, they're letting it go to the past. So in this sense, we understand that the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, it's a symptom of a global process of change, which is the Anthropocene. So we live now in the Corona scene, the moment where the emergence of the COVID-19, the pandemic, shows us what it is to live in this new time, in this new age, the Anthropocene. Well, with due respect to our friends, geologists and, and stratigraphers, we are discussing the scientific issue if we are living in a new geological epoch or not, we understand that the Anthropocene is a cultural concept in the sense of Kardashev, Sagan, planetary civilization theory. The Anthropocene is a symptom of our civilization. It's a symptom of the fact that today our actions recover 
all the planets, all the globe, and the consequences of our actions are very far reaching. So, in this sense, as a civilization, a civilization uh, a, a, a symptom, uh, the proper frame to address uh, the, the, the concept of the Anthropocene, this new age where we will all live, we, our sons, and the remaining of life on Earth, is complex system theory. And a complex system is a system where the structure, the constellation of these components, its dynamics, the ways these components function with each other, and its context, the substrate where flows of matter, information, and energy flow within and without the system, they are all intertwined. In structure, dynamics, and context, they are, in a certain sense, all affecting each other. So, uh, uh, if we uh, think uh, as uh, Earth, Earth as a complex system, then we can understand that both society, civilization, humanity, and the environment are complex subsystems of this global system. And uh, 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 these uh, 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 complex systems, uh, uh, due to this mutual affection of its parts, it uh, uh, can exhibit some critical points in their dynamical trajectories. That is, some subsec subsection of the, the system uh, can go to a critical regime where the structure is changed because of its implementing itself through its dynamics. That is, the functioning of the system changes its nature. That's what a nonlinear complex system does. And so, uh, the Anthropocene means that many of our uh, subsystems, both in society and in nature, are now undergoing, uh, 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 heading to critical points of transition. That is, what is a crisis? A crisis is when you have a certain domain, and uh, uh, this domain this has a structure, is functioning, and, and it suddenly a uh, fracture appears. So what you do, you reform the structure, you make a reformation, so as to fill up the fracture, and resume the functioning of the, the system, uh, perhaps in a new regime. So that's what's a crisis, that's a solution of a crisis. But when you have many parts, many subsystems of a system going into criticality simultaneously, when the, effect, when the criticality of one, one part of the system affects the other, Makes uh, uh, induces catalyzes critical criticality in other in other in other, uh, in other parts, then you have a global widespread crisis, as if the fracture covered up all the territory, the territory and the crisis and the fracture identify themselves. This is no longer one crisis. This is a mutation. So the Anthropocene, the recognition that human activities have become a planetary shaping force is a sign of a mutation, a necessary mutation that we, in our, as a society, in our relation with nature, in nature, with, in, within its relation with ourselves, uh, will have to, to withstand. So, uh, uh, perhaps the most important fact of this mutation is that the Anthropocene is inevitable. We, our sons, our grandsons, and the remaining of life on Earth will live in the Anthropocene. But we can steer the Anthropocene to these or that possible scenarios. There are many Anthropocenes ahead of us, some more amenable, some very dramatic, very disturbing. But we, we can steer our civilization, uh, our relation with the environment. We, we can steer, have to steer uh, a, a complex system Earth to a more favorable uh, scenario, that is a possible future which coincides with a desirable future. So uh, it, it is in our hands since we have become the makers of the Anthropocene in the last two centuries, then uh, we, we have the means uh, to steer it on this or that direction. 
In this sense, uh, 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 the most important aspect is to understand that society and the environment are mutually folding and unfolding. Actions of society upon the environment came back, come fold back upon society because of this, of, of this effect upon the environment. In this sense, it, uh, 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 the most important uh, way uh, to face this challenge is to um, uh, change the drive. That is, this change the way in which civilization, society, and environment has been relating to each other, uh, both parts of the complex system Earth, uh, uh, since the beginning of the industrial, industrial civilization, in the beginnings of planetarization of humankind. So we have to change, and this is a very difficult task, we have to change the very core of the capitalist endeavor. That is, we have to change from accumulation, runaway accumulation, and what has been called progress, develop progress as way of development, it is in fact the spreading out of economical activities to all regions of the globe and the converting of all citizens into consumers, as we see today. We have to change this very core of accumulation to another, another uh, very different uh, endeavor, which is to build resilience and to be to, to 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 use circularity, not accumulation, but circularity, frugality in the sense of Franco Berardi, uh, uh, as the way we uh, we manage our relationship with uh, with our environment. That is to say. Capitalism up to now was to expand in space. It's able to expand in space to englobe everyone. He will eat triumphant. He, he did that. But now his challenge is to extend in time, to become permanent, become durable. So this is a, a change in the very core of the capitalist endeavor itself. Uh, we don't know if it is going to happen or not. But anyway, we live in the Anthropocene and according to the, the changes that happens in this economic core of our civilization, we will have to this or that possible future scenario. So, uh, we come to understand in this way that uh, environment emergency and social inequality are in fact twins, inseparable twins, Siamese aspects of this uh, uh, planetary dynamics. So, uh, sustainability is inseparable from conviviality. That is, how we want to live with the world is inseparable of how we want to live with each other. Um, uh, environmental degradation and social inequality are both critical parameters that in other past civilizations, Maya civilization, many others, has led uh, to collapse. Sometimes reversible collapse, sometimes irreversible collapse. So there's no reason to suppose that it will not happen to our planetary civilization. Uh, in this sense, uh, what is the role of cultural institutions, science, art, and academia, and all that? I think we think that it is to convey the notion of, uh, 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 of inserting, of uh, uh, absorbing the very unhuman and very uh, 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 unusual time sets uh, of nature uh, within the fast pace of culture. That is, as, as Nicole has mentioned, a very difficult task of making people understand hyper objects, just like the plant as a whole just like biological evolution. And on the other hand, they also very difficult test to make people understand that our technology today can uh, operate within fractions of a fraction of a fraction of a second and of a millimeter. That is, we are able to intervene in the very foundations of our nature, of our structure, of the structure of every material. 
So both in the long range and in the short range, uh, uh, we have to deal with this, uh, with this imperceivable, with, with this, uh, uh, with, with this uh, phenomenon which we are not uh, used to. And so the main role of cultural institutions in the Anthropocene is to make people understand that our humanity is based and operates upon many humanities, non-humanities. That is, uh, to people understand that the, 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 the fast, and the, the, in the fast pace of our culture, uh, minutes, hours, days, weeks, you have to take into account centuries of climate change, centuries of, bio, of biodiversity degradation and regeneration, centuries of making the oceans fertile again and not uh, make them up with 400 deserts that we are seeing today. Uh, so this unusual time frames must become part of our cultural experience. And so uh, every cultural institution must be an education institution, not in the sense of, of, of a school education, in the sense of this civilizational education. People become aware of the effect of what is the reality uh, where we live. And so uh, the, 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 the fundamental role of cultural institutions is to promote a dialogue, promote dialogue within, uh, 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 to, to overcome this obsolete distinction, obsolete opposition between uh, uh, nature and culture. Uh, as a part of a complex system, the complex system Earth, uh, th this opposition is, is completely obsolete. Uh, we have to overcome it. And the way of overcoming it is a dialogue. In which sense? In the sense that science, for instance, here is a way where we can speak with non-human entities. We can speak with the stars. We can speak with exploding stars. And here what they, they tell us. We can speak with virus. We are, we are now having a, a, a strong conversation, a strong discussion with a virus. Uh, we discuss with molecules. With, with many invisible aspects of our reality. So our science is a way of dialoguing with nature, with the, with the, with the phenomena of nature. And so uh, art is a way of dialoguing with the unknown. Art is the uh, uh, probes of, of human spirit that goes deep into what uh, the, the mess of the unknown and uh, of, of, of the scales of the unknown and takes new forms new ways of thinking, uh, new ideas, novelties. So uh, uh, we can be inspired, for instance, by the ways, uh, by the wisdom of originary peoples. Here in Brazil, for instance, we have uh, 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 originary uh, peoples. Uh, and for them, uh, uh, a mountain is an ancestor, a river, um, uh, is a relative. A tiger, a jaguar, is a brother in the sense that they all speak. The mountain speak, the wind speaks, the river speaks. And the society, the tribe, hears the speak and, and speaks back. So this idea that we can dialogue with non-human entities and science and art and education are the tools for this dialogue we think it's a very, very interesting way uh, to overcome this, this split between uh, a, a nature and culture and, and to prepare ourselves, to equip ourselves with skills to navigate to the Anthropocene, to the best, to the best Anthropocenes that we can devise, that we can, that we can uh, produce. And uh, the fact is, uh, uh, we have to take into account the, the, the absolute evidence that uh, humanity is made of many humanities. That each of us as an individual is in fact a multitude. We are comprised by something like 100 billion human cells, but in each of us 
lives 200 billion organisms, non-human organisms. About one kilo, one kilo and a half of us adults is non-human. That is what makes us human. The fact that we are this, in, we have this inner ecosystem, that we are habitats for this multitude of orders. So our ident identity, our nature, uh, is profoundly related with this otherness. And so, uh, as, as there are many humanities making up humanity, many stories, many cultures, many histories, many traditions, we, have, we are also ourselves many. We belong to an outer ecosystem and we are an inner ecosystem. So this understanding uh, 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 makes us uh, 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 project uh, uh, that uh, now uh, uh, cultural institutions have this foundational, absolutely important uh, role of education, of spreading information and uh, uh, fostering engagement. And also due to this ethical uh, necessity, to the ethical imperative, uh, cultural institutions must be clear to them uh, that uh, we also have a political dimension of action. Today, as we see, uh, important leaders, political, religious, entrepreneurial, are actively fostering ignorance, superstition, and bigotry, prejudice. We have to take a stand we have to, 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 to stand for the value of science, to the values of science as the way of, of, of building our common future. We have to stand and to affirm that Earth is not flat. Vaccines do cure. And education is, do, is really the way uh, where we, we, we can empower ourselves to build this common future that we all, we all want. So... Uh, uh, today, we have the means to make this steering, to make this, uh, 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 the, the, this directioning uh, uh, of, of, our, of, of ourselves uh, towards a desirable future. We do have this means. We do not have to wait for nuclear fusion. We do not have to wait for faster than light travel. We already have the means. We, we lack a vision and we left political decision, political action. So education, we think, is the basis by which we will become uh, bridge builders. We will build the necessary bridge that connects what came before us and what will come after us. If we are able to build this bridge, the future, the future will recall us with nostalgia. So let's hope that we can be good artists. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Luis. That's uh, extremely thought-provoking and, and inspirational. Um, I want to take a brief break now. Uh, my time says it's just, uh, just before four o'clock. So let's reconvene at 10 past four and um, feel free to refresh yourselves in the meantime. And then we'll take questions from the chat and also from one another and uh, have a, have a, a, what I hope will be a very fertile and, and um, uh, thought-provoking discussion. So I look forward to seeing you all back in just by my clock, 11 minutes time. See you then. Okay. Thanks very much.
Hello, everybody. It's, it's 10 minutes past four by my uh, clock. Um, can I ask all of the speakers to turn on your cameras, please, and join us for the, the collective discussion? We've got Birgit. Hello. We've got Hello. jean Luis. So we're just waiting for Nicole to rejoin us. And then we shall, um, shall start the, the collective conversation. I hope everybody managed to get themselves a, a little bit of a refresher. Uh, just to stretch your legs it can be quite a, a punishing process just on the, 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 the physical form, spending a long time on a, on a computer meeting, but I hope you'll all feel a bit refreshed. I hope that goes for everyone in the audience too. We're now all back. There are several questions emerging in the chat and, and please, to our audience members, please do uh, put more questions in the chat as they occur to you, whether it's responding to the paper specifically or to the discussion we're having now or indeed just general questions that you'd like to raise of our speakers that pertain to this question of uh, the Anthropocene, how museums can address the Anthropocene and particularly the role of the arts in addressing the Anthropocene. Uh, but I want to open the conversation by making, making an observation about all of your talks and asking you as it were each in turn uh, to, to reflect a little bit on this, this issue which is that it, it, you all mentioned in different ways that the Anthropocene is a political concept and it's a political way. Um, this was apparent in the way that uh, many of you talked about particular projects, the need to educate, the need to challenge disinformation, uh, allusions to the particular political uh, context in which we're working. And of course, Greece, your talk was profoundly political and, and very, very powerfully political. Um, really uh, all the way through. Um, uh, so I'd like to start by asking you, each of you, to reflect a little bit on, on firstly, whether that's a, a change that natural history museums are having to face, to, to become political institutions or more overtly political institutions. Um, and also how how that plays out in your different contexts, because you're you're working in in very different countries, different political situations. Uh, the, the Musée National is, of course, a state actor in some ways. It's an arm, uh, or at least connected to the French state, which puts you maybe in a very different relation, perhaps to the Carnegie or the Museum of Tomorrow. Um, and and of course, uh, uh, there's there's an elephant in the room here, which is the issue of the American election. We had been originally intending to schedule these meetings for last week, and that wasn't why we moved them, but I'm very glad that we did move them, uh, partly given uh, the, everyone's attention was absorbed by that. So that's what I wanted to, to open up to you all. And maybe, um, maybe I'll, I'll, I think I'll just take you in, in the order in which you spoke to start with, and then we'll see how the conversation goes on. And if people do want to interject, please do pop up your hands and I'll, I'll uh, mention that. And of course, do, do continue to post comments in, in the chat. So Jean-Denis, what's your reflections on the political role now in the, the current context? Um, <clears throat> the, if, we, if we address the question of, uh, of the change in the museum, I can develop a little bit that what what I, I just mentioned that it was a, 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 a big disruption in the in the position of the museum in the society. Um, clearly, at the end of the last century, uh, the museum in Paris was declining because uh, natural history was considered only in the framework of science. And in the framework of science, molecules, genetics was really the, 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 the main target. And natural history was considered as a little bit eldish. Uh, we, we uh, starting from the Rio conference in 1992, uh, we, we, we uh, realized that we can play a uh, con, uh, a completely different role. We can renew completely our position without stopping to do our traditional activities, of course. But uh, I think that it's the, during the, the 90s that finally 
uh, we, we, we begin to make this change, we were not completely aware that it will, where it will lead you, us. But, um, but the change, for example, was in the reflections between uh, human sciences and, uh, and natural sciences after the Rio conference. Um, uh, the, the traditional knowledge were more taken into consideration. Uh, and this was a, a new, a new um, domain of development of our researches. Uh, a second important point during this period was that we, we begin to be aware that we were able to make a very important contribution to uh, the, the, the global challenges um, by um, inventorying uh, the, the biodiversity, the, the environments and the landscapes. And this is at that time that uh, developed so much uh, this activity in the Museum of Inventory, monitoring natural areas, uh, protecting and discussing the different uh, issues connected to uh, prote uh, total protection, uh, anthropological protection, and this and that. Uh, and, and, um, and finally, we had a very abrupt um, change uh, between 2002 and 2006, I have to say, uh, because uh, it was a new, a new breath for the museum, and uh, it was it, it was a very um, risky period because uh, a lot of uh, people and some of the ministries in France told that it was no more useful to 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 go on with research, teaching, and uh, and expertise in the museum. And that we have to concentrate now only on um, collections and, and display to the public. And uh, there were very hard discussions at that time. And finally, we reconstructed the, the, the scientific targets. Uh, and and uh, following that, we reconstructed also, but later on, a new way to, to, to discuss to, with the publics, uh, with all the publics, the great public, of course, through the exhibitions and through um, uh, um, citizen science, for example, but also um, the, um, uh, the social actors uh, which um, ask uh, us expertise or uh, advices uh, or uh, uh, estimation on, the, on the, the state of nature. I don't know if it's... Uh, uh, a good answer, if it answers your, your question. Yes, yes, and very interesting to hear about the fluctuating um, brief, the, the, the kind of con, con, the, the way in which governmental intervention has changed at different times what the museum is, is allowed to do or, or, or instructed to do, and the way in which the museum has, re has reconstructed a position in response to that brief that's in a sense been able to reclaim uh, the role that you, you, you needed to play and you wanted to play. And just one word uh, more, if I can. If I, can. Uh, I have looked, uh, I've seen a, a question in, in, the, in the chat mm -hmm. uh, asking um, how we integrate the concept of Anthropocene in the museum. Yes. But it's, I, I, I didn't spoke a lot of Anthropocene because uh, uh, it's, we, of course, we know this concept, we have uh, deep discussions. Uh, like uh, um, uh, Louis told, we have discussions with the geologist, uh, telling it doesn't exist as a geological uh, stage and this and that. But uh, the most important for us is really not is not really to conceptualize this change. Is to uh, the target is to integrate uh, this, this change in all its complexity and to tackle. The, the challenges. We are more in act, in the action than in the reflection. Even though some of my colleagues would not be really happy to hear that because they are really <laughs> in the reflection about that. But I think that the museum is really trying to to become a major actor of reflection in the society and play this uh, this uh, citizen role uh, through the 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 many um, the many asset that uh, it had. Uh, it, it has. Thank you. Really?
very much indeed. And thank you for picking up that question from the chat, which which is uh, was interesting, uh, a kind of interesting question about how how the concept and the rhetoric around the Anthropocene is is always not useful in different contexts. Nicole, can I ask you about your kind of reflections on the political change? And again, this is something that you signaled it somewhat in your talk too. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, it's a really important point. I think that the um, certainly at the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, it, it is challenging us uh, politically in, in a number of ways, but I think that it's um, tension the museum knows it needs to take on and wants to take on, and that's really exciting. So I would, I mean, I, I distinguish between, there's kind of two levels. Um, there's some of it is is really fundamental of just being able to speak openly about a concept like climate change, which, uh, you know, isn't controversial in the science circles. And so in many ways, it really shouldn't be considered a political act to speak about climate change, right? It, it, it's, it's very well established, a very scrutinized, um, area of scientific research that's, um, you know, we have the IPCC assessments to uh, speak to the kind of strength of that um, scientific work. Um, so I think on the one hand, it's getting comfortable as an organization um, speaking to topics like climate change and just kind of mainstreaming those issues into the work that we do. Um, but then on the other hand, and this to me is really the, the more um, confrontate more political domain that we're getting into um, and, and, and definitely part of facing the Anthropocene because, you know, it's true in the geology circles, you know, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of debate about it. There's, um, it's a kind of a narrow question, but really it's a cultural concept yeah. that many, many mm -hmm. different practitioners are engaged with. Um, and it's become, I think, a kind of device to write, to reflect upon the history of science, the history of um, of the kind of Western worldview and the way that it's diced up the world and and then kind of extracted right resources and people and labor to kind of create this consumption that has um, and this way of using the world that's that's unsustainable and has created the social um, inequity crises that are within our nations and between nations and. Um, so as we're talking about that and engaging with that literature, um, that's causing us to really start to intersect with ideas like decolonizing, right? Decolonizing museums and what is the, um, you know, really reflecting on the kinds of dire, like what, what are the implicit ideas and biases even in these old dioramas that we just have been displaying for, for decades, uh, even centuries without questioning who made this? Why did they make it? What was the political conditions in which they made it? What, uh, how was the, how were these, um, these objects or, um, beings, right? How were those bodies assembled? How were they, um, collected? You know, what kind of violence was part of that history? And so that's, as we're starting to confront those questions, that's opening up a political, um, domain, um, and a political kind of, Mm, I don't know what, you know, tension that's pretty new to the museum and is, is uncomfortable. And there's some folks in education and curation who are really ready to tackle these questions and others who feel really uncomfortable with where the museum is going. And so we're doing a lot of work to not only think about how do we reach visitors and engage with these difficult conversations, but how do we work in, in our community, right? In our communities of practice, to develop our understandings of the role that science has played. And, you know, and I'd say this is where we're learning so much from others, like, you know, there's a conference next week on decolonizing natural science collections, for example, and uh, we're coming out of the London Natural History Museum. And um, so I'm really excited about these, this kind of political turn because, you know, science is always political, right? So. Thank you very much. Um, Birgit, would you like to pick up on some of those themes? Because you, of course, mentioned decolonizing again in your talk. 
Um, yeah, but not, and I think actually maybe picking up on what Nicole just said in the last sentence, it is, science is always political, but it has not for a long time not been recognized as such. And I think that's just a problem. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's where we see ebbs and flows of, you know, how you engage culturally, uh, with the practices of the science or how you engage with different audiences, how you engage uh, with the arts. I mean, the ebbs and flows at the Natural History Museum in London that I could observe in Berlin is the same, you know, and, you know, we probably can all come up between us with lots of different examples where we can observe the same um, uh, ebbs and flows with these, um, with these cultural engagement. I was excited to hear what um, you said in Paris and the activities of how natural science and culture is seen together. And maybe that's where there is a stumbling block for natural history museums as institutions because fundamentally they are systematics institutions. You know, will they abandon the system that they've worked with since the 18th century? I mean, you know, obviously there's a recognition of different cultures of collecting, of ordering systems, of conducting science, and clearly we have um, different ways of understanding uh, the natural world through subjects like ecology or, you know, that's reflected in exhibitions that sort of came from the 70s where you created uh, exhibitions that were, could address biodiversity, for example, and so on. So, you know, there's a slow lag always in addressing some of the politics of the practices of science, and that's really important to recognize. But it's uh, sort of ex exciting to hear what Louis was saying about his ideas. You know, maybe we have to just abandon some of these institutions completely and just restructure them. Interestingly, you know, there was much reference to one anthropologist, Anna Singh, but, you know, I'm sure we can all think of others that come into this. So how how important anthropology has become as a topic, you know, anthropology looking at the human relationship to the natural world. So you know, that's what anthropology does. And and so, uh, you know, how can we defend natural history museums? You know, is this just tweaking at the edges when we say, well, oh, yes, we have got one education program on this, or we have a series of talks on this. It's very, very difficult. You know, I, I you know, I, I find it's very challenging. I'm not saying we're not do, all doing good work and, and you know, to, to alleviate and to address this, but, you know, maybe we have to think about this more fundamentally and need to challenge the type of institutions that we call natural history museum. Thank you very much indeed. That's a provocation which I hope I will all have the chance to respond to. But um, and maybe maybe I want to hand over at this point to you, Louise, partly with the thought that Birgit's just left us with, and, and she was herself picking up on your your talk about kind of fundamental changes, but also maybe to introduce here a couple of questions that are prompted by your talk in the chat uh, from Nicholas Watson and, and from Paul Smith. Um, Nicholas particularly asks if you can comment on the role of museums in accessing the consciousness of populists who are not concerned with the, uh, the Anthropocene. He uses the example of a support for deforestation uh, within Brazil as a, as a consequence of, uh, or rather undermining the contributions of the Rio conferences. And Paul sort of opens up that question and extends it a bit more, which is how to engage the unengaged. How do we get audiences who are, uh, unengaged in relation to environmental crisis or even disbelieving of the environmental crisis, how do we get them to recognize it? So can I can I ask you what your thoughts are on those questions, Louise? Well, uh... I think that the, the issue, the most decisive aspect of, of this set of issues uh, is indeed this merging between nature and culture. Uh, let me quote the uh, philosopher Jenny Bennett when he rediscusses the meaning of the, the word geopolitics. Uh, before, geo means earth, means the territory, uh, that is nature, essentially, and above it and upon it, there was the actions of politics, the actions of humans, of society. Society dialoguing and warring and making all things. So uh, nature was understood as a basis and a platform upon which, and indifferent to, uh, there, were, there were the affairs, the human affairs. And he says now, uh, geo, the earth, nature, the environment, has become the subject of human action that is the subject of politics. 
In this sense, politics now recovers, acts upon geo. So geopolitics is, is completely different the meaning today of a geopolitical strategy has to take into account the long range effects, the global effects of economic and social and political actions upon the basis of our living. So it, it, it's a completely different set of ideas that we, we need to deal with this now, now merging. And so institutions like museums, science museums, natural history museums, art museums, uh, ethnographic museums, they must all rethink their role. Besides preserving a collection, exhibiting a collection, having an educational uh, 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 role, they also have unavoidably a political stance. Because today, uh, any, any uh, uh, expression of science, of evidence-based knowledge, became subject to attack, became subject to uh, populist, let's say, uh, uh, approaches, trying to make an opinion value the same as an evidence. Mm. So this, this has nothing to do with science itself, with the scientific method, with the production of, of evidence-based knowledge, but it has to do with the workings of politics. In this sense, the same thing that happens to geo happened to science. It becomes political. It cannot be, not think as a political agent. So when we state the value of vaccine, for instance, then a, 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 a fascist monster, like the, the current Brazilian president, says that uh, uh, vaccines are, are to be dismissed. Uh, 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 this is scientific. Uh, 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 how can I say? This is a political uh, uh, based attack on science. And so now uh, the, the, the expression of science must be also political. So we think that we must understand as institutions that we are now our political voices. And in that, uh, perhaps, for instance, we are trying to gather together many museums, similar museums, with, uh, 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 future-oriented museums, as we speak. There are 12 of them uh, around the world now. And we are trying to make a common statement affirm the value of science, of evidence-based knowledge, of the necessity of solidarity, of ethics. So uh, uh, perhaps with, with the respectability that science institutions have uh, for most of the public, uh, here in Brazil and certainly also uh, everywhere, everywhere else, uh, these statements can have a weight and contrapose and, and contradict uh, uh, these populist attacks. And uh, 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 in the case of, of Brazil, we're living a very sad, a very sad moment uh, where uh, the, this populist approach, Trump inspired, Bolsonaro is a puppet, is a, is a, um, a marionette, uh, of, 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 he has no, no stature for even being a naval leader. He's, he's, he's in fact, well, uh, let me stop there. Uh, 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 but uh, we are obliged uh, to, to, to make political statements just by making science statements. You see, uh, 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 it's not a, 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 politic, uh, uh, a science moved by political intentions. Politics derives from science, from science affirmation. And we cannot not affirm science. We cannot do that. So uh, uh, I think that we are in the, in, the, in the midst of this accommodation of mindsets, of, of political relationships, of, of standings concerning the building of this new stage of our civilization. We are a planetary civilization now. We are many, as, as, as Hannah Harent told us, is the human condition that we are many. And so if you, we, we want to make unities, we have to get together. And to get together is to be political. So I, I cannot see uh, a, a cultural institutions uh, throughout the world today without a political stand. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that rings very true. And it's also reminiscent of conversations I remember having um, 
uh, where where Paul was talking about the the, the trust that and the trust and authority that natural history museums and other museums have with the public and, and the kind of platform that that does give you as institutions to take a political stance that is, is counter to some of the disinformation and, and, and kind of abuse of science that is that is coming out. Um, can I pick up on, on a couple of questions that are that are in the chat then that take us into thinking about the institutions themselves a little more? Um, we had a question, uh, and one, one of them, I suppose, is about uh, takes us into thinking about the humanities, and one of them takes us into thinking a little bit about the, the art, back to thinking about an aspect of the arts. Um, but let's start with, with a question from Chiara Gabellotto, who's, who's in from Berlin. Uh, and her question is, is about the workforce of natural history museums. She asks how the scholarship from environmental humanities or ecofeminism or the anthropology of science uh, how far that arrives at and circulates within the institutions of museums themselves and across them. Um, is it something that is discussed among the practitioners in museums? Is it something you're kind of, uh, you and your colleagues are, are uh, directly um, interchanging ideas about? Or is it something that there is a, a kind of, um, any kind of obstacle to that work coming in? Or do you feel it to be peripheral? What are your perspectives on, on that? Can I start by asking Nicole? Sure. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think that it's um, it's happening a little bit, but I would say in my experience, it's uh, still relatively peripheral, um, and that these, you know, the kind of classic humanities science divide is um, at play, right? Where um, there's a challenge in. Um, people trained in really different disciplines to understand each other and to be able to interact with um, the different uh, practices in say, environmental humanities, ecofeminism literature, that there's not a, um, it might be hard for people to engage with those ideas and it's just not in their um, comfort zone. So I think that goes both ways, you know, um, between the humanities and, um, and, more natural science folks. So I think that's a huge area of, um, for me, that's the really exciting opportunity is kind of creating, bringing people together to have these conversations and to start to develop a shared language and um, and drive it, you know, these forms of solidarity and kind of new new assemblies, right, of people working together. That That's, that's so um, exciting. Thank you. Uh, just to say, I was struck by by uh, you, yourselves and uh, and Louise too picking up on um, uh, Timothy Morton's work, uh, because thinking of somebody who has emerged in, in actually as an English literature scholar. In fact, Timothy Morton taught me briefly as an undergraduate, so I'm kind of I haven't really followed his career as well as I should have done subsequently. But um, uh, but but yes, yeah, so that an instance of that coming in from from that kind of uh, eco critical side. Um, uh, Jean Denis, can I ask how far that work comes into play in the kind of human sciences work that you do within within the museum and uh, that your colleagues do there and have been working with? Oh, you're muted, I think. Sorry. Yes, yes, uh, it, uh, it's it's developing. For example, we we are developing um, some of our labs are really. Uh, multidisciplinar that is to say that they are in uh, uh, the, in the same laboratory in the same scientific team um, ecologist true strong ecologist uh, and um, uh, politics specialist and uh, um, uh, people working is, uh, especially on the uh, mediation uh, museological mediation uh, and they they all work together and try to, to to create a continuity between these different approaches and also to address some um, um, deep questions such as uh, um, the question of the occupation of soils. What should we do? Uh, uh, the question of uh, what what uh, how how we can make uh, connections. Uh, between the public which visits our galleries and 
the the public which is involved in citizen science project you know it's very different questions but in all of them you have this connection between uh, uh, specialists of humanities and and uh, natural history specialists um, also we have um, more and more important reflection about ethics uh, ethics mm -hmm. of science ethics of uh, some um, uh, developments of science such as bioinspiration, biomimicry. Uh, we are work we, we, I create in my direction a, a special group for reflecting about that. Uh, I also create a special group for uh, citizen science, which is uh, devoted not only to coordinate and to and to, to 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 rise the general level of the of the protocols, but also to think about what they mean as a social phenomenon, uh, how you can decline this interpretation of uh, citizen science in different um, uh, in different parts of the societies according to the to the the age of people to uh, and this and that. So uh, the, it's it's the beginning, I think. But uh, uh, now we have really uh, very integrated uh, researches in some of this uh, domain, and one of my my target during my, my my time at the direction was to stimulate uh, these interactions because I'm myself an archaeologist, but I'm a bioarchaeologist. That is to say that I'm an ecologist, but I learned also uh, social sciences, and I always try to understand archaeology uh, in the light of um, of uh, social approaches and natural approaches. Uh, integrated all together. So this is really, I think that this is the, the characteristic of, of natural history, but especially in our museum, this is really uh, the basis. And now we are trying to, to, to get uh, better and better in, um, in this uh, synergy between uh, humanities uh, and uh, natural history. Excellent. It sounds very inspirational what you've been able to accomplish by bringing together uh, people from different disciplines to work alongside one another in the same labs within the museum. Yeah. So that's yeah. a model that, that is, is extremely productive. Um, I, I'm going to take on the, the, the next question and hand this one over to, to uh, Luis and Birgit at least to start, which was is, is picking up on the, 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 the art side, perhaps, rather than the humanities side. This is... Um, from uh, Kamila Izikovits, um, who's saying, thank you for all for the brilliant and thought-provoking presentations, which I'm sure is something that we would all second. And then Kamila asks, I was wondering how you think um, design could be included into the museum's work on the Anthropocene and environmental issues. And Kamila is a designer themselves working on, on human and non-human relation uh, and writes, I think there is a huge space for collaboration that is not much explored, uh, for example, bio-design, design with living beings as part of natural history. Um, so that's a question that I want to ask. I think maybe I'll pose that first of all to, to, to you, Luis, because uh, I think we'd also all like to hear more, a little bit more about the design features of your own museum and how you approach design within that museum and whether you, what you think in response to Camilla's question about uh, the, the, the kind of role of design in addressing the Anthropocene. Yeah, I think that uh, this question relates in, in, the, in the sense, well, in the, the, the uh, Egyptian of tomorrow relates with the previous question. That is, how do you relate natural sciences and humanities? Mm -hmm. uh, since we are a very infant institution, we took an original approach inspired by the works of a physicist, Victor Weisskopf from the MIT. And he uh, organized, so he organized the, the scientific contents of the museum within two poles. The first is the cosmic sciences, that is the science about the totality of which we are part and about the constituents that makes all matters. So particle physics, chemistry, quantum physics, and on, on, the, on the one hand, and cosmology, astrophysics, planetary science on the other, all these are cosmic sciences. This is the big, the, the big framework where the other pole, the sciences of the complex system Earth, uh, uh, are based. So, uh, from this point of view, the science of complex of the complex system Earth, they comprise all aspects of our existence, 
matter, life, and mind. These are dimensions of our existence. So from this point of view, ge from geology to paleontology to physiology to biology to psychology to so sociology, all the sciences belong to the other pole, the pole of, 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 of the, uh, the science of complex system. So this is the way we distribute our content. And we understand very clearly that for the science message, the science information to be best conveyed to the visitors, you must enchant them. You must engage their attention. And most, mostly when you are speaking about future scenarios, you must engage their imagination. So we use the resources of art, of, of, of the, the, the expressive powers of art, so we can, we can set questions of, 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 of science, meaning of science content, but to present them in a very seductive, seductive way. So uh, for us, uh, we have to, uh, answering the, the next question, for us in the Museum of Tomorrow, we have to supplement or to complement the STEAM disciplines, uh, science, technology, uh, uh, engineering, and mathematics, we have to supplement it with architecture and design. So to get something like a steamed, a steamed uh, a, 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 a set of, 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 of abilities, set of contents and of abilities connected with this content. That is, without design, we will not be able to devise proper solutions for the huge problems and for the local problems that uh, are our challenges for the near future. So uh, design, is, we understand, is the fundamental capability, just like language, just like programming, just like uh, many, other, many other skills, uh, so that we, we, we can, in fact, project and design the future that we want. Thank you very much. Sorry, it was just somebody briefly popped into, into to Paul's office to ask a question. Um, so, uh, can I ask them, can I, can I redirect that question also to Birgit then? Because you've worked a lot on the, the I mean, your current work is on the last 50 years of sort of art in, in response to um, Anthropocene problems, or anticipating Anthropocene problems. But do you also have a perspective on this question of, of design among the arts as being something that, that has responded to the preoccupations or concerns that we've been discussing today, or indeed something that has a contrib contribution specific to make Following on from what Luis was saying about the, the kind of fundamental need for design to take take a take a role in this. Yes, yeah, so, um, often there's a bit of an uncomfortable relationship between designers and artists, and I think that's often because artists think designers work to a brief. But I think that often in recent, in, in particular, in environmental projects, been made put to good use in a way that yeah. often you see collaboration between artists and designers in to make something work either for the public um, or to, to develop a, indeed a solution for something. So within the Anthropocene discussion, you have got a huge body of work which uh, looks at the biopolitics that are embedded in the Anthropocene. So that, uh, at, you know, at that level of, of invisibility, of you know, viral and bacterial scale, um, but also um, looking at uh, species Extinctions, for example, and 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 how relate how we can one can recreate um, species that have gone extinct during um, um, living memory, for example. And so, um, and there are also organisations actually maybe we worth mentioning is a little bit more brings into discussion. We've talked a lot about natural history museums, and I've talked a lot about collections and making use of collection and reusing collections. So on, but there's an awful lot of work that gets done by other organizations as well who think about the future. So the speculation on nature, uh, you know, who would, would describe themselves more as sort of maybe art and design, art and science organizations that have, that work on tem with temporary exhibitions and temporary collaborations on who often tend to be those who put forward uh, works that are located more in design. And here I'm sort of thinking biopolitics, sort of think thinking, for example, the work that the Sharing Foundation did in Berlin, for example. Um, but also, um, if I don't know if you know the, the the work that the Welcome Collection has on display, you have a soft, an interesting sliding scale, as it were, from artists. You know, if I if I stereotype this a little bit of you know doing um, 
critical analytical engagement with questions and then a designers putting something putting this learning into um, promoting ideas and solutions i think these things sit really nicely together and so uh, so the, the current display for example welcome collection on human life put, puts that forward in terms of um cohabitation with other species but also other aspects of what if we were to live in space or what is our food production and so on so you know there are some really uh really interesting lines of thinking that can develop in in joining some of these these thoughts even though i'd still dare to say that artists and designers do approach problems quite differently um but uh, a couple of the projects that i showed at the museum um in berlin so Elizabeth Price, who worked on the uh, on the on the whale, um, design was embedded in all of the inquiries in a way. You know, so she worked on the history of a particular whale display. How was it displayed? But also all of the elements that were taken in the 19th century and early 20th century of uh, the species of a whale. What did they serve in terms of design? How did they shape human bodies in terms of? millinery or corsets or um, um, collar shafts and the oil used for lighting and so on so you know there's um, there are interesting um, connections analogies to make in terms of socio-technological histories which are really interesting to explore and um, so also the work by um, Clara Hobson which I don't know if you recall the animal Okonomad so you know the whole work relied on designing a an interactive uh, structure that was um, uh, an open friendly space to engage the viewer with questions around how does an other uh, a non-human species view me as human so that question could only be answered if you have a properly designed environment, in this case, a photo booth, which people could use. So, you know, you can see how you ask a question somewhere and you need to resolve it and embed it into design aspects, or you investigate something and you can see how, in particular, uh, humans have made use of animal species um, to, to shape our world. And they're sort of interestingly questions of design quite naturally come into our our design histories in a way so the way we surround us of how we've created culture if you come back to anthropological questions in a way but uh, i would also particularly as i mentioned earlier highlight the biopolitics because this is of an important area that's uh, quite key to the anthropocene discussion but uh, much less visible or really quite um difficult to curate and to commission in a way you've got quite different questions in order to put other live organisms into an exhibition space and for audience to engage with it so there's a whole set of ethical and health and safety questions that you know you you have to tackle but are really fascinating you know how you how you do that and how you can able and maybe more of that and how now we need to you know we need to think about now in this of covid pandemic we need to think about this differently and maybe they'll spur us on in order also just to understand the ecosystem that that we are yes so maybe there's a call for more biopolitical works in a way and to, and to enable that yeah yeah thank you very much this is um uh very kind of gratifying for me the way this conversation and discussion has gone because it's really brought us right back around to the beginning of this conference the first session of the conference was on design and architecture within Natural History Museums. Um, uh, Nuno Ferran showed us a fantastic, uh, the museums in, in Porto and the, the role of the whale, in fact, within the story that they were constructing there that was also very much concerned with uh, Anthropocene uh, themes. The, the, the new project in, in um, uh, Copenhagen and Strasbourg, or the, the renovation project in Strasbourg was also again connected with some of those themes and the questions of the intersection of design curation, display all came together. Uh, and indeed some of the buildings that I was looking at in the, in the, in the initial talk, um, uh, thinking about um, museum design and decoration. Uh, we have just one or two, I, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to, to look at the chat because there are several things coming up in it. We've got very few minutes left. So I'm just gonna pick out two uh, particular questions for particular people. Um, so uh, for, um, Luis, uh, there are two very quick questions for you. Charlotte Elton has asked if you would be happy to share the text of your talk. 
Um, I don't know whether that's possible or not, but I can can hopefully say that we'll be able to to, to um, release the recording if if that's okay with everybody when the time comes, which will be next week. But also, there's a question from Nicholas Watts. Uh, looking forward to the day when we when we do all get together. Is there a link to the other eleven global future museums which you could post in the chat? So if you have a link to the to the other museums or to that network of museums that you've cre created. Uh, please do post that in the chat. I think we'd all be fascinated to, to, to read more about that. Um, and there's one question also uh, for Jean-Denis uh, about the manifestos. The manifestos generated a lot of interest in the chat and people were asking where we could buy them and other people found out where we could buy them and sent links and so forth, which is great. Um, but uh, there's also a question from, from Will Tattersdale. Do you know um, who's buying the, the manifestos? Have you got a sense of who the audience has been who's been actually picking up those books. Oh, you're, you're muted again. Rather easy to, 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 to buy uh, uh, on the internet and the web uh, at different places, but I, I, didn't, I didn't check by myself. <laughs> I think it's for you. But I just wanted to know whether you knew who was buying the manifestos. Just, it's very a very quick question and a very quick answer if you've got time because we uh, we should wind up. But do you have a sense of who they're reaching? I, I didn't listen. Sorry, because it's of who the who the who is buying the manifestos at all? Ah, okay. Who is buying the manifestos? Um, <laughs> difficult question because I, I have not all the, the the information. I think uh, we 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 sold a lot in the in the libraries of the museum. Yeah. But I don't know uh, how many people uh, ordered the manifestos uh, by by the web. I, I don't know. I have not the information. Oh well, we will. We will. Our, our is the question. Well, you, you probably get another fifty sales now, anyway. So that will help to <laughs> um, boost the online sales. Okay, uh, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank our four speakers again for fascinating, really fascinating, and inspiring presentation. So thank you all very much indeed for speaking and for, for joining us. Uh, I'm delighted you were able to. I want to thank all of you who are in the audience for, for coming along to hear today's talk and indeed to the earlier sessions if you were able to join us for those. Um, and to say that, uh, uh, as Jack said at the beginning, we're hoping very much to be able to post these recordings on the Symbiosis website. Um, Symbiosis website, uh, maybe Jack, if, you, if you're on this, you could perhaps just post a link to the website in the chat again so that people can find it if they haven't found it before, if they found it as through some other means. Um, and we very much hope that you will continue to be interested in and take part in the conversations that we're having as Symbiosis. It's very much a, an open network. There's no set membership. So please do all take part. Uh, the website and the blog will keep a, a record of, of what we're doing. If you're interested in working with any of us on projects, please do get in touch. Um, uh, and we hope, we hope to be able to host meetings again in person in the not too distant future. Uh, maybe in some of the museums represented in front of us here on the screen today or who participated earlier in the in the week. Uh, we're also hoping to be able to host me the meeting that we that we've had to put online here in, in Oxford. We will we will make another endeavor to get uh, as many of you as, as, as key we can get to you to, to come and join us here on some subsequent occasion. But uh, that's that's the end of the Symbiosis Conference 2020. Thank you again for, for taking part and for joining us. And um, I wish you all well, keep well in the current circumstances, and uh, um, good luck with all your, your various endeavours and with confronting the, the, the challenges that we're, we're facing in this, this session today, the challenges of the Anthropocene. I hope we can work together and create the, the better futures, navigate to the better futures that you were talking about, Luis, the better versions uh, of the Anthropocene. That's where we need to get. Thank you all very much indeed. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.